Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Stormkeep. My name is Paul, and today I'm joined by... Hey, it's Dan. Hey, it's Cody. Hey, this is Margot. Today we will be talking about why you should use Dracolines. They are a fantastic little unit. We are all really big fans of Dracolines this season. Uh, their unique combination of, of speed, damage, and utility uh, puts them in a different role than other units that we have in our army, and they are filling that role very well. Alrighty, starting things off, we got to shout out our awesome uh, friends over at Kaiju Gaming Lounge. Uh, Carl and the gang are awesome supporters of us. They uh, give us our prize support for all those cool painting contests, which, by the way, there is one right now for Evocators. If you want to go ahead and paint up some Evocators or Evocators on Dracolines, uh, which we're talking about today, uh, go ahead and uh, check out our Discord. We'll have information there where you can post, and uh, you can have a chance to win uh, some prizes. So you can check that out in our Discord. Uh, but if you do use uh, code Stormkeep on Kaiju's um, website, you do get 15% off, which is pretty cool. Uh, if you do, if you're an international viewer and you want to order from Kaiju, um, we'll need to go ahead and talk to Carl in our Discord. You literally just at Carl, uh, he'll come up under Kaiju, and uh, he'll help you out. But they do carry our awesome merch, which is our uh, Deep Strike sticks. We got a nine-inch and seven-inch stick, which is perfect for just like in the picture there, deep striking those annihilators. Or if you play Beast of Chaos, you know you can bring in your guys at the seven-inch. Uh, then a nine inch for general use, you know, it's a really good stick. Like, and they come in several colors. You can even order them with the uh, the framing still on there, basically like the sticker. You can spray paint them or paint them your own colors and uh, peel it off, and boom, you got your own custom stick too. Uh, so they're pretty cool, and as well as our dice you see there, which are super special, awesome. So check them out. So I guess to to try to convince you to use Draculines, we should answer the question: Why not just use Fulminators instead? Uh, they are very similar units, both of them being cavalry melee hammers, and they cost the same amount of points, and they are very similar. Uh, however, they fulfill different roles on the battlefield. Fulminators want to be fighting big threats in the middle of the field. Um, Draculines want to be fighting softer targets on the flanks, and we'll go over the reasons for why that is exactly. But basically, Fulminators are the line breakers, while Draculines are the harassers. Uh, Draculines are kind of like a Stormstrike chariot, but they deal a lot more damage, and they have a little bit of a worse save. <laughs> yeah. They're kind of like Chariot Plus, right? Like you're not, obviously they're not going to fit in the same point slot as Chariots, but sometimes you find yourself in the spot, you know, you've saved some points, you've, you've taken the Night Relictor, you've, you know, maybe not the Night Relictor, but you've, uh, you know, moved those uh, Vindictors or Sequiturs down to Vanquishers and you've got some points floating around and, and you can upgrade here. And it is, it's quite a difference. It's definitely worth the extra, um, extra 70 points. It's a lot, but it's, it's really good. At 240, there's a choice between two Fulminators, three Dracolines, or a Stormstrike Chariot, and three Aether Wings. And these days, I'm personally preferring the Dracolines. Uh, Fulminators want to be save stacking. You know, they because they have a three up save, they can get to a two up save and ignore Rend one, Rend two, and always be saving on a two plus. Uh, so you want to give them a whole bunch of defensive buffs and throw them down the middle of the field. Uh, however, Dracolines are better served harassing flanks because they. <clears throat> Uh, Draculines are better off as a repost unit because they don't need to charge in order to deal damage. So if they start the if they start combat phase within three inches of an enemy, um, if they charge into your lines and you just counter pile in with them, they're going to do their maximum damage the whole time. And you can use both in the same list. Uh, you could, you know, we're going to make a case for you to consider using two Fulminators and three Draculines together in the same list. They're a self-sufficient unit that does not require any support from the rest of your list. You can just plop them into your list the last 240 points or, you know, if you have 260, something like that, you can fill the last 240 with Draculines. Uh, there's very, like, <clears throat> as you can see in the table on the left, Fulminators and Draculines are very similar units. They're both 240 points. Uh, Draculines have one more model. They have three more wounds. They have a worse save, uh, but they are faster. They are a wizard, and they get to reroll charges. Uh, the main difference, I would say, is that Fulminators want to be reinforced, or at least they, they can be reinforced. Uh, Evocators struggle with this because they only have one-inch range, and because as soon as you reach six models in a unit, you have to deal with fighting in two ranks, which is a very awkward rule in Age of Sigmar 3rd Edition. Fulminators don't have to deal with that problem because they're only two models in a squad. So when you reinforce them, they go up to four, and they can fight all four of them get to fight, and it's, and it's great. Even uh, even outside of, I think, um, Cody, you run them in your cities list, right? Your Tempest Eye list over Fulminators? Absolutely, yeah. Fulminators just fill a different role, and it, it's exactly like you said. They are just value in a bundle. And, and you think about the hybridization of this unit. It's a wizard, it's high mobility, it's, it's reasonable damage in different settings. Like, it's not high rend, but they also have the mortals. So they can scratch the paint on any target you throw them at. They're a great counter-skirmishing unit, they're a great flanking unit... 
especially in uh, in Tempest Eye, where they get that extra movement, that extra save turn one. They're, they're a great amount of reach out and touch someone that takes enough investment to peel that they have to commit to it when it's it's not the unit they want to be committing to. So they're <laughs> they're almost a distraction carn effects for me. They're going to go off and do their thing, and you're either going to deal with them or I'm going to have 240 points holding an objective, you know, here or there whenever I need to. The plus one save bonus from Tempest Eye is, is really, really big. Uh, going from a four up to a three up uh, seems like a 33% increase in durability, uh, but it's actually a lot more than that because you're you're reducing the amount of failed saves uh, from three and six down to uh, two and six, which means you're actually uh, increasing your effective health by by a lot. <laughs> it's, a, it's a lot more than 33%. You are actually increasing your effective health by 50%. Uh, but then you know there's there's rend values and things like that, so it's not exactly like getting a, a five up ward, but it's similar. And in terms of tempest eye, just that extra little that extra little oomph, because I mean at that point you know you can all out defense them, you can do whatever else you want to do. It causes your opponent to overcommit to them. In in some like fulminators, people are going to commit to every day. They want them off the board because they know what they can do. Evocators. Mm. You know, not so much. They they don't know what they can do. They don't want to commit the extra resources to them. And if they don't, they're not going to kill them. And even if they leave one left, that's that's still a fast kitty cat that can take an objective. I think that's really what it boils down to is just recursive value. They, you know, they're extra extra wizard. They reroll their own charges, which is just extra value. You don't have to worry about having that command point when they go for their charge. You get the reroll anyway. So they're just a bundle of good value. Multi-types of damage, high you know, movement, decent wound brick. Just They, they do a lot of stuff well. You know, we're, we're kind of jumping the gun here. <laughs> Let's discuss this uh, fairly exhaustive list of pros and cons. I'm sure there's extra things on here that we I didn't even put on these slides that we can talk about. Uh, but first off, Draculines are fast. They're, they're a 12-inch move, and they reroll charges natively. And there's two really good things about that. First off is that 10 inch move doesn't feel like enough sometimes, even though this season we're still fighting stuff in the middle. Uh, sometimes you don't necessarily want to deploy your unit all the way up to the front of scrimmage. You want to put it behind a screen and those, those extra two inches basically offset that. And then 10 inch move, you can get maybe, you know, within seven or eight inches of something and then they'll redeploy and they might get like a four or five. And that's like the worst thing ever uh, because you've just increased your charge up to something very difficult or maybe even impossible. Uh, the ability to reroll charges is also very nice because you can issue forward to victory on another unit that's charging in to have two rerollable charges. Or you can just not use a command point and be more efficient that way. Here you can see a damage table that we generated using uh, Stats Hammer. Uh, you can see the link there at the bottom of the slide. This, this damage table assumes no buffs whatsoever, so you will not have plus one hit or even plus one to wound, even though Draculines do bring their own plus one to wound, we just assume the cast didn't get off. And we compared Draculines fighting all the time, uh, they, they don't need to charge to get a bonus. We compared that to Fulminators without charging bonuses, and then Fulminators with the charging bonuses. And you can see that Draculines do a lot of damage. They do comparable damage to Fulminators on the charge which if you've played Stormcast in 3rd edition or played against Stormcast, you know how good Fulminators are. This is just demonstrating just how good Draculines are. They're almost doing the same amount of damage against all targets. Yeah, it's funny that the Fulminators, the the most that they're, uh, or I guess the most discrepancy they have to pull ahead of the Draculines is that 4-up save, right? Even at a 2-up, like I talked about earlier, your the mortal wounds are actually helping carry the unit just a little bit over Fulminators, right? Like, it's not significant, but it is over, right? Like you're 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 well within a wound on most of these, and at most with a four up save, it's like a, a wound and a half on average. So it's and, and and more than that, if it's like a six up save, now it's swinging back to the dracolines. So this is a this is a really cool unit in how the damage distribution is done. Yeah, and another interesting thing to note is that as you get into like two up save with with ignoring rend one, ignoring rend two, uh, because you have so many save bonuses, the Draculines actually loop back around and become better than the Fulminators, even if the Fulminators charge, just because the mortal wounds are so potent against a two up save ignoring all rend. So back to the pros and cons, you can see Draculines do really good damage, like Fulminator level damage. And in fact, when they're not charging, uh, the Draculines do a lot more. Their high volume of attacks allows you to reliably clear softer screens. There's This is a problem a lot with Stormcast lists is that uh, you overcommit resources or you undercommit and because of de bad dice rolls, you don't clear something. Uh, so you end up overcommitting pretty much all the time. Like you'll send six long strike shots into a screen just to make sure that screen is dead because you need it out of the way for your, for your tactical purposes. 
And their high volume attacks on the evocators help kind of offset that randomness that can occur. Um, it, it's a big difference. You know, a couple dice, bad dice rolls when you're rolling 12 dice is, is very different when you're rolling, you know, 20 dice. The lightning arc in particular is also really nice for this purpose, um, not just because it helps you punch through high defense units like two up saves and, and things like that, uh, but it also happens after you attack, so you can you can avoid wasting damage on overkill. So let's say you're fighting two different units, you put all of your you kind of split your attacks up because you're such a big unit, you're fighting stuff. Um, depending on how well the combats go, you can be like, oh well, this unit is pretty close to being finished off. I can put all of my lightning arc damage into that unit, uh, which is which is a really cool piece of utility. When you combine their speed and their power, you get a really good unit to harass flanks and objectives, uh, something that you can't really do with anything else in our book. Units like Prosecutors are fast, but they're not punchy. Units like Fulminators aren't quite fast enough, and their damage output is better spent somewhere else because you want to reinforce them and stack buffs on them. Uh, Storm Drake Guard are fast, but they're more durable than they are punchy, so they don't quite fit this role, and they're very expensive. Uh, so Draculines have a very cool niche carved out for themselves. Yeah. So the other thing on top of that is, so this combination, right, you, have a, you have a combination of speed and power. And it's not, you know, not something that you typically want to reinforce. It's it's going to be faster though. It's going to be more uh, maneuverable, which is perfect for your flanks, right? A lot of these new um, objectives, especially if you look at a uh, position over power, you know, you're having to head off to the sides of the board, and you really want to uh, have something that can actually reach out there and, and, like Cody said, reach out and touch something. So, a 12-inch move combined with that reroll charge, combined with not even having to charge, right? If you get out there and you, you know, kill a screen and you're stuck on um a pseudo tanky hero they're going to still keep doing their max damage right like there's other options for them that full majors don't necessarily have access to full majors kind of want you know investment because they just scale better with investment um so they're just they they really shine on that flank um the other thing is uh, along with uh, being on that flank a lot of times your flanks is where you want to deny space I see this a lot, like I, especially when I'm using like dragons in a min unit. I really like their three-inch coherence and their large base for you know covering out, you know blocking things out. Uh, these three models sometimes you know you have to have to take up a lane, and this being your side unit that you're you know you care about it, but you don't care about it maybe as much as your main hammer. Obviously, you can really spread them out and deny a ton of space, and really be like, hey, do you really want to come deal with this? waste a whole turn potentially you know if there's a double turn situation be stuck there there's there, there's a lot that goes into the mind games here and they're just super tactically flexible because of that on top of that the the other combination in there speed power you've got utility right these are wizard it's a wizard unit so while the the whole unit is a wizard you know they have a bigger unbind i guess area than you know a knight encanter right he's a little uh, 40 millimeter base these guys are, are the three cavalry bases, right? So you can go ahead and, and stretch them out, and they can really uh, re they can deny more um, wizard area, you know, to unbind. So that's really nice. They bring their own buff, so it doesn't take up celestial blades. They're a little self sufficient, though they don't really scale as well as fulmators do with that plus one to wound buff. It's free, right? Like you're you're not doing anything else with them. You can't cast Mystic Shield on on their own. You know, they can literally only cast in power. So you just do it. You just go for it. Um, so that's a super nice bonus. Um, and yeah, if you got one model within one inch of Arcane Terrain, the whole thing's got plus one to cast and unbind. And that's another, you know, really strong thing. This is a fast unit. If someone, uh, depending on your terrain pack, if someone has Arcane Terrain, you know, towards the middle of the board, you can you can get up there and uh, and threaten their, to unbind something against an army that really cares, you know. Sometimes your Knight Encanter uh, isn't in range for, um, if they're not running Techless, maybe they're not in range to unbind. Um the five award from Lumineth, the uh, um, protection of Hish, and then you have to, you know, they give you the first turn because they're one drop. You can run up and and attempt to deny just a, that little bit better. It's it's little things and little points of efficiency that put these Dracolines over. I think Fulminators in uh, as a min unit. Yeah, there's definitely problems running this unit um, in squads of six because you lose two models to cohesion when you're attacking. You do get the full lightning arc, which is nice, uh, but I think running two by three is probably the way to go. That way you get an extra unbind, you get more coverage, um, and, and even then I don't know if I'd use two by three. It seems like a single squad of three is the way to go. Yeah, yeah. At min units, absolutely. For sure, but... You know, getting them up to the higher units, we're talking min units today, but getting them up to that higher unit size can actually give you some decent crack with that lightning arc and allow them to punch way out of their weight class on targets, you know, that might be hard armored. But 
the wizard keyword is really what what intrigues me and what actually calls me to start thinking about him for Tempest Eye. You know, they can't cast it themselves, but Laocon, you know, the, the 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 boatman allows you to pick him up and put somewhere else. Yeah, that's definitely something I didn't mention on the slides here. Uh, Laocon is is an, for those who aren't uh, aware, he is an endless spell that allows you to uh, move a wizard effectively in the hero phase and then move normally in the normal movement phase. Uh, so you can, for example, teleport a unit of three Dracolines, 18 inches with Laocon, and then move 12 inches, giving you a tremendous threat range that like nothing is safe from melee combat against that. Uh, when you add in the rerollable charge, sometimes you can get even longer threat ranges. It's crazy. And that combo works because Laocon doesn't specify wizard hero or a single model that it's a wizard. It specifies wizard keyword. So as long as you have at least two Draculines in the unit, they count as a wizard and they can use Laocon. So on a map, uh, it, it, one of my test games we were playing on Nidus Paths, and I just had them in that back corner with a wizard who could cast Laocon, and just they were a threat that could be anywhere on the board at any time whenever they needed to be. And it's spectacular. That kind of mobility, they can be counterpunch for me if somebody gets in my lines, if somebody leaves me a valid target, we can leap at it. Just the amount of mobility that you get from these guys, the options open up by them just having that wizard keyword is, is really incredible versatility. And then to top it all off, the evocators can just dispel Laocon the following turn in case like you can't get it quite into the, the right range. Uh, you can dispel it for free during your opponent's turn, and then one of your wizards can recast it uh, after translocating into range to, next to the evocators. It's really, really cool. And it's also a great escape plan, too, um, because Laocon, when it moves, it takes the wizards with them. It, it doesn't really matter. You can use that to get them out of harm's way, to get them somewhere else. It requires a little bit of setup, but, you know, if your opponent's about to, uh, you know, they're positioning to hit a target, they're positioning to actually hit those guys, maybe the only way they can get on that particular objective is to actually charge your Dracolines, and then, you know, the, uh, the boatman just takes them on a merry little ride across the board somewhere else where they're now a threat somewhere else. It's an excellent piece of utility. Yeah. It depends. Yeah. yeah, I especially like that point, Cody, because especially if you're if you're going second and you can threaten the double, it's kind of an extra utility, right? If they don't have as strong of wizards, you're you're pretty sure they can't unbind Laocon, which is a bit of a higher casting value. Uh, I think it's an eight, right, to cast Laocon? Pretty high, yeah. Yeah. It, oh, it's it six. Takes. Okay, it's not so bad. But even then, like that's still you know, uh, that's still something they have to roll against. You can really you know take the gamble, and and at worst, you know, if they're off on the side, they're just going to go in the next turn. And if not, you know, you can either get them out, reposition. Or uh, they'll spend, uh, you know, an unbind on that. So that's that's something to think about. As I mentioned before, you don't have to charge with advocators to get their full damage. So they're they're a fantastic like counterattack, repost type unit where you keep them just within three inches of uh, of the front line of where enemies can charge. So like two point five inches from the front of your models. That way they have to finish a charge in range for advocators to hit them. And because they're such a wide unit, you know, physically wide, <laughs> uh, you can cover a lot of space with them. And it's really, really hard to avoid pulling them into combat. And once they are in combat, only one model in the unit needs to be within three inches in order to unleash the full lightning arc from the whole unit. So you take all nine dice and you dump it into one model within three inches of anyone in the unit. It's really, really good. Uh, because of their damage profile, they, they're great for counterattacking, but they're also good as a, a supporting charge unit. Uh, for example, if you want to cover a flank when your Draculines or when your Fulminators charge in, you could put some Draculines just beside them uh, to limit the amount of space that your opponent can pile in against your Fulminators. Uh, yeah, your Draculines are going to take hits, but that's less damage being taken by the unit you really care about. Like this is a you know, 240 point throwaway unit, not necessarily throwaway, but like tactically you're okay with losing it if it, there's a greater goal of protecting your Fulminators. Um, and this is very much the same role that chariots fill yeah similar to literally like just doing what the, what the chariot was doing for us so it's uh you know while chariot still has its place draculines are 100 percent a worthy consideration because of that i do like the the 15 wounds on them too uh because you know you're, we're starting to see a little bit more mortal wound spread right? i mean like the slanesh book just dropped <laughs> so you know you'll you'll have mortal wounds just kind of randomly pocket uh popping around places so uh, that extra mortal wound uh, buffer of health, because that's really the only way you can stop mortal wounds, in case you haven't watched our mortal our video on wounds and mortal wounds. Um, it's it's health, right? Health is has the buffer for that, so it's pretty nice if you've got them in a castle with Gardas. It's again just a little bit more value, just little little things that they do um, that aren't necessarily like head and shoulders above fulminators, but it is a bonus, right? Like you've got to look at every the whole package when you're comparing the two. Um, I really like their wizard utility. Uh, I often sometimes feel myself find myself lacking unbinds, um, so having an extra unbind is pretty cool. 
Uh, and yeah, mortal wounds are pretty nice. Which I, what I really like about them is people really love hiding their uh, relation champions within an inch of things now to prevent the, them from being shot. And mm -hmm. that's better for Draculines because you can easily just delete a screen with the attacks and then touch something with mortal wounds and kill it. So oftentimes it produce like a two for one value uh, on, for you on the board, which is something Vulminators can't necessarily do. I like that point about the arcane terrain too, though, um, because yeah, you, you don't generally want to pay that many points for uh, a wizard that has no bonuses, but the ability to put one inch with an arcane terrain feature and spread them out gives you a huge bubble, a huge bubble of plus one, you know, to dispel. And that's, I mean, these are utility pieces. They're what we're talking about. They're a hybridized unit that can do a lot of different roles. And if you really need them one match just to be the thing that's in unbind range with the bonus, they can do that job just fine. Yeah. They might not do it every time. They might not unbind that, uh, you know, Deep Thinker's um, protection of Hish. But that one time that they do, the couple times they do more often than another wizard would, that's going to matter, right? Mm hmm. Now the, we're talking up Draculines like they're you know the, the second coming of Christ over here, uh, but there's definitely downsides, right? They're not a perfect unit. Uh, they fill a very specific role. They do it very very well, and it's really exciting and it's fun to use them because of that. Um, but we got to go over the downsides as well. Uh, so the, I, I'd say one of the main ones is that they they are never battle line, no matter which storm host you pick, no matter what general you pick, you just can't make Draculines battle line. And that inherently makes them an inefficient unit compared to something like Fulminators in Hammers of Sigmar or Retributors even in Knights Excelsior. Annihilators with Grand Hammers can be battle line in Knights Excelsior. Um, there's just no way to make this unit um, into, into a battle line unit. And that's awkward. Um, so that this is more of like, I've got 300 points left. I've got 250 points left. How do I fill those slots in a list? Or I need something fast and punchy, or I don't have enough unbinding in my list and I'm just going to get rolled over by magic and I'd like to have some chance against it. That's more of where Draculines come in. So you can't just spam a list with them. And that's all downstream of the fact that they're not battle line. They have low rend, so they can really struggle to fight armored targets. Um, I know that the lightning arc is, is good against that, but man, sometimes it feels bad to fight <laughs> like two up save knights and just bounce off them constantly. It can be very frustrating if you don't deny that mystic shield or if they have extra command points for all of defense, like if you're not pressuring them in other parts of the board. Uh, they have uh, definitely the biggest weakness of this unit is that they can't fight well reinforced. And three models is just not enough to take down the toughest targets. Like you, you can't send three Draculines in to take down a Gargant or to take down uh, 30 Blade Geist Revenants. You're, they're just not going to do it. Um, unfortunately, because they can't fight while well reinforced, that's kind of their limit. They're stuck being this, this like medium damage hammer unit. They're not quite a heavy hammer. Uh, they're not quite a light hammer either. They're somewhere in the middle. And it, it hasn't been obvious where that, that exactly where that niche is, or how useful that niche is. And finally, their four up save uh, does really make them vulnerable to other hammers. If you get hit by something like uh, Chaos Chosen, you know, maybe a block of four Fulminators can survive that, especially if you uh, position units around them and you have save stacking going on. That's that's fine. Uh, Evocators on Draculines are not gonna survive against heavier units. Uh, maybe if you they were reinforced, they could, and then they'd be worth save stacking on and then dropping a Gardas next to them because they'd be a lot of wounds and a lot of save bonuses. Uh, but because they can't reinforce, they're not really worth buffing defensively. And that makes the four up save uh, kind of a liability. Like it's it's usually fine because they're not gonna be fighting things that are you know super heavy hitters. They're not gonna be, they're not, people aren't generally sending Ren 2 into these guys because Frankly, that's a waste of resources. Those attacks should be going into other units. Um, so the 4-up save doesn't matter as much as you think it does. All right, so I thought we would round this video out by looking at different lists that we use in our Lords of the Storm episode number six. Uh, you may have noticed that there's a lot of evocators on Draculines in those, and I wanted to go through uh, some of the inclusions and discuss why we included them and what they were kind of doing in that list. Uh, so this one here is called It's Hammer Time. It's based around using 10 Retributors in Galatian Veterans so that they can fight two ranks finally and teleporting them around with Translocation and Wild Form hopefully to, to land some seven inch rerollable charges. Uh, but the this list is incredibly slow and that's kind of what the Draculines are doing in here. Not only are they a secondary hammer for the Retributors so that you can you know punch two things in two different spots, um, Draculines can play flanks very well, uh, but they're also just a fast unit. And if you look at the movement characteristic on this list, it's very slow. This list is relying on shooting and very little movement. Uh, so just having a fast hammer unit really helps offset that weakness. I think the Draculines here make this a, a two in movement instead of a one. Uh, here you can see a game using that list against Iron Jaws. 
I deployed in such a way that um, because I know I knew my opponent had a battle regiment, they had fewer drops, so they got to choose to go first or second. I positioned very defensively here in a castle formation with my vanquishers up front and retributors ready to repost after the after they're wiped out, and the draculines off to the side. Uh, this positioning was very favorable to me because it allowed me to uh, split his army and leave him with basically nothing aside from what he would charge in with. Um, and he he took the bait. He took the first turn and charged in with a mock Russia and 18 pigs total. And I was able to, um, you know, I lost all my screens. I lost my two units of vanquishers. I lost my aether wings. My retributors were able to punch through. And then the draclings were able to charge in and help wipe stuff out after that. If he allowed me to go first here, I would have translocated my retributors up and gotten everything within 12 inches up so his mighty destroyers would be basically worthless. Um, so this it was the right choice, I think, for him to go first in this case, uh, but it did leave him in a very in a very poor position. And the Draculines, I think, are what, what sealed the deal here. Being off on their own, it allowed them to uh, either come in and, and help wipe out the, depending on how much he committed to the initial engagement, uh, it would allow them to either come in and help clean that up or to send them out and charge something else across the table. Uh, in this case, since he committed his all three of his hammer units of pigs, uh, the Draculines ended up coming in and, and clearing stuff out. In the Dracul Blizzard list, you will notice that there is a unit of four Fulminators and three Evocators on Draculines. Uh, this is because this list wants to move the Fulminators with a Phoenix, Castellant, Relictor, Battle Mage, and Crossbows, move them all into the middle of the board, um, maybe even force the opponent to go first and then engage on top of them, and the problem with that tactically is that that leaves you very little uh, aside from that engagement because all of these pieces are there to support the fulminators. The crossbows are there to wipe out screens. Castellan and Relictor are there to buff up the fulminators as well. Frostheart Phoenix exists there just to, to support the fulminator charges with, with roars and with the minus one wound thing, keeping them alive longer. And all that's left then would be two units of five sequiturs, uh, which you'll probably have to use as screens, frankly, and then you need something fast to contest objectives. And a Stormstrike Chariot, you know, that could fit in this list, um, but then you would not have enough punching power to get through on other objectives. So this is a kind of list that you you don't want to split your forces up, and then the Evocators are the thing that can split off and do things on their own. Uh, so that's how they fit very nicely into this particular style. In the Golden Tempest list, uh, you'll see there are no Fulminators in this list. In fact, there is no primary melee hammer here at all because what this list is trying to do is to teleport six tempesters up the middle of the board give them a whole bunch of save bonuses and just shoot everything to death and and because the tempesters are also decent in combat they're not great but they're decent in combat um, if the opponent tries to engage into you you will be able to bite your way out of that combat and then move around and shooting stuff um, so this is kind of a a, a similar style to like using a block of four storm drakes, putting them in the middle with a bunch of defenses. Uh, but unlike that, the tempesters can shoot, so you can't just ignore them. You can't walk around them. They're going to be doing damage every single turn, even if you don't charge into them. And if you do charge into them, well, you're going to have a tough time chewing through that many wounds on a on a zero plus save potentially. The Draculines in this case are a crucial speed piece that could support you on flanks. Uh, because you have all your eggs in this Tempester basket, you really do need a second unit that can go out and contest things. Um, this is kind of, this, this list needs some changes, I think. I've been playing it and playtesting it, and I'm not sure if only having two different units that can go out and do things is, is enough. Uh, but the Draculines definitely feel very, very good in this list, that's for sure. They, they play a crucial role as a harassing flanker, flank contester. Um, they can reach the things that the Tempesters can't or ideally don't want to reach because you want them sitting more or less in the middle of the board, kind of just swaying back and forth between the central objectives. Yeah, I think originally when we were trying to come up with this list, I think you had two chariots here and we had the points for the, the Dracolians. And it was like, well, I don't really want the Aether Wings, do I? And this was that same scenario, I think. Yeah, in this list, I also found it beneficial to cut the two chariots because uh, well, cut the two chariots and aether wings because it reduced the drops. I was able to fit more things in the battle regiment, and this list really does want to go battle regiment. It wants as few drops as possible so that uh, if you want to take the first turn, you ha you maybe have that option, uh, or if you want to force your opponent to take the first turn, you also want that option. Six tempesters are just not the highest threat range. Even if you translocate them, they only shoot twelve inches after that, so they're they're limited in what they can hit. Next up is your Dueling Dragons list, uh, Daniel, so take us away. 
Yeah, absolutely. This was this is what I was super excited about when I first saw this uh, the the reduction in points down to 240. I immediately wanted to slap the bit alongside dragons. Uh, dragons being a 12 inch move, being that quick threat, uh, it just fits perfectly with what evercators are trying to do. My dragons are going to be taking up that uh, that uh, reroll charge roll sometimes. I mean, they have their own inherent once per game, but sometimes you want to you know save that if you've got the you know the command points. Uh, it allows the Dracolines uh, to really shine as they, they don't take up a command point. It adds me another unbind. While Dragons do ignore spells on a 4-up, uh, you still want to unbind uh, those buffs, right? Because Dragons can't ignore buffs. So um, they bring a whole a whole another unbind to the list. They, uh, like I said, the speed, the the whole, like, them being able to be their own package, right? Like, it's just like with the other list Paul talked about. The Star Drake guard, the Castellan, you know, the Judicators dropping down in their area. Um, they're, I'm making a small castle. The Draculines are off doing their own thing, right? They're going to do whatever they want to do. Um, sometimes I am going to put, you know, uh, a castle buff on them, maybe, if I know, like, some light shooting is going to try to come at them, and I can split buffs here. Uh, but sometimes I'm, I'm going all in on the Storm Drake Guard, and uh, those Draculines are off on their own, and they're going to still perform, which is what I really need them for. Uh, the other defining feature of the Dueling Dragon style, or, you know, dragons in general, is... Sometimes you just forego a relictor, right? Like dragons just move so quickly that you don't really need the relictor. It's attacks. You want to take the castellan, uh, just because Stormtrake Guard costs so much. Um, you can't really afford the relictor. So the evocators, um, being quick on their own is another bonus, uh, just because of that, right? They need to be self-sufficient, and this list definitely, uh, definitely relies on them to be self-sufficient. So this was my favorite inclusion because this was running a fulminator before. Like that, that's what it was. It was a min fulminator in that slot. And as soon as I was able to slot these in, I was so excited to do so. Uh, this list is called 9L because it uses nine long strike raptors. Uh, you could substitute something like you know 10 crossbow adjudicators in for some of the shooting units. Uh, but the basic idea here is that you don't have a proper melee hammer unit. You don't have anything reinforced that can just obliterate something. Uh, the idea here is you've got two different uh, melee hammer units, softer melee hammers, like three evocators on Draculines and two fulminators. And then the shooting kind of adds that damage where you need it to be. Uh, that way you're not overcommitting resources in any particular spot on the board. And as long as you can protect your shooting, uh, it seems like this concept seems, is working pretty well. Uh, so here you can see a game I played using this list against the Kabbalist sub-faction in Slaves to Darkness. Uh, this is at this photo that you're seeing now um, is after my first hero phase. Uh, you can see the Geminids were cast. I was translocating my Vanquishers up to, to deny space. Um, but basically my opponent deployed with a battle regiment. I was able to counter deploy uh, and force him into a situation where if he let me go first, you know, he would avoid the double turn for sure. Uh, but if he let me go first, none of his heroes would be left on the board because I have sharpshooters. Um, the only hero left would be the Chaos Lord who has a retinue of 10 Chaos Warriors. Uh, so being Cabalus, he wants to get a lot of value out of his draw to, drawn power and cast Mystic Shield on his hammer units to survive against my hammer units. Um, so he opted to take the first turn and he put his knights on the left side, and his uh, Chaos Warriors on the right side, two very durable units. I believe the Warriors were Mark Nurgle. And I was able to uh, deploy, counter-deploy my, my Evocators on the left side, along with some Terra Wings to, to potentially scream at them and, and deny them some commands. And I left six Long Strike Raptors in reserve. Uh, here the arrows are kind of indicating the flow of what happened the following, like during my turn. I moved my Evocators up on the western flank, and I was able to charge in and just to... Uh, minimize the pile in for the knights i put my terror wings on the right side of the knight so that when he did go to pile in the knights would have to go towards the terror wings and split the unit and thus you know take even less damage on my evocators uh the geminids were able to move up and tag a bunch of units to prevent redeploying so his champion could not get on the objective uh, because this is on the battle plan where only champion if a champion is on an objective then only champions can contest it and my fulminators uh charged in the flank of the nurgle warriors on the side uh, to tie them up, allowing me to just walk a champion onto the objective and take it. From there, I dropped in my unit of six long strikes. I decided to snipe out the general, which is the demon prince you see in the back there, uh, because I know Slaves to Darkness really, really wants command points, and being able to kill the general uh, denies them a command point every single turn. So as you can see in the resulting photo, I did win the double turn, uh, which is one of the gambles my my opponent took when he when he gave me when he gave himself the first round. Um, over two turns of combat, my evocators were able to destroy all but one of the Chaos, Chaos Knights. They just kept making that, that Battleshock uh, roll successfully. And I put very minimal shooting in there. 
um, because I had dropped down my six long strikes where you could see them in the middle, um, just just in line of sight of a chaos sorcerer lord that was hiding behind the building. And I put three. I had to put additional shots into the demon prince because my long strikes uh, rolled low on thunderbolt volley and three shots. Um, so very little shooting power went into the chaos knights on the left. Um, I think they took out maybe two of the knights, and the evocators took out the rest over two turns of combat and lost nothing in return, which was great. And then even once the uh, ogroids were able to charge in on my opponent's turn, I was still able to have one evocator with one wound remaining, and he was still able to contest the objective, which felt great. So this battle uh, showed off that even up against a two-up save like Chaos Knights using all that defense, Evocators were still chunking away at them, doing significant damage, uh, tying down my opponent's resources, and after his general was dead, he just didn't have any command points left for the rest of the game, and his units were not fighting very efficiently. Heck yeah, and I can tell here, like, you probably started your activations with the Fulminators, right? And then the, you know, the Draculines, he had to hit your Fulminators back, right? Like, that was kind of what you were going for? Well, actually, in this case, I was fighting with the Evocators first because I, I, I knew the Fulminators would be okay. They had Mystic Shield from a previous turn, and they could always all, they could always all at defense to be saving on twos against a Ren 1 attacker like the Chaos Warriors. Okay. And that's it for this episode. Thank you to all our viewers, and especially to our patron supporters. If you think we missed anything or our analysis is lacking in any way, then please leave us a comment down below the video. Even better, if you want to interact with us uh, all the time and uh, a bit more directly, please join our Discord. Uh, we love to talk, uh, just talk AOS all the time. Our community is really awesome. Uh, they, I don't even know how like we foster the community like this, but they just they talk so analytically. They talk so, you know, just so focused on getting good games in, sharing their experiences. The Battle Reports channel is my favorite channel in the Discord. So I can go, I go in there every day and I see uh, you guys out there, you know, putting models on the board and and using some of the things that that we've showcased. And and even better, I get to learn some new stuff from you guys and uh, your battle reports, get new info that I didn't know, and that's just awesome. Uh, thank you guys so much for for sharing the battle reports. You know, uh, we got hobby section, post your models. We do our contests like we talked about. Um, so check that out. That's at the top of the Discord uh, once you join. Yeah, our Evocator painting contest is going on right now. So if you have a unit of five Evocators or three Evocators and Dracolines, maybe uh, from a previous edition, or you just are a very quick painter, um, feel free to drop them in the Discord before the contest ends. And uh, that ends on the 31st, so that's ending soon. But uh, yeah, if you like our stuff, also consider becoming a member on YouTube or supporting us on Patreon. We don't usually talk about it too much. Uh, we use that to you know, help, uh, help get our stuff... Uh, Improved our equipment. We got a new mic from Mergong, so he sounds a lot better. Uh, just, you know, little things. Uh, we really appreciate it, guys. In terms of upcoming podcast episodes, we've got the Battle Tome review for Blades of Corn. Uh, you know, it's we we were thinking about doing a Slanesh review, but it just, there's something about that book. Uh, it doesn't, I don't know, it doesn't look great. It's not very exciting. I might put down a rapid fire review for that. Yeah, but if you, if you want to put it in the comments, I'll, I'll put down like rapid fire review. This is what they're going to play. This is what you should be afraid of. Boom. Yeah, it didn't seem as deep as the corn book is really the biggest reason. I think the, the army is probably still fine, but you know. I think it's, yeah, I, I mean, we're going to, I can totally put together a rapid fire review, but yeah, it revolves around like three units and that's it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and one of them isn't even in the book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. I, yeah, yeah, sort of is, sort of isn't, but yeah, yeah. One of them, one of the main units that this army wants to take isn't even in the book. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the corn book, on the other hand, we are very, very excited about. Um, so look forward to that. It's going to be a longer one, uh, five or six hours, I think, and we're going to go very in depth, like we do usually with our battle term reviews. We also have our long-awaited how to counter Zinch video uh, coming. There's there's been some scheduling conflicts because we have a very special guest coming on. Uh, arguably the best Zinch player in the world, Caleb Walters, fresh off his uh, best overall performance at Adepticon 5-0 and uh, Golden Ticket. So he's going to come on and and he's going to be literally a magician that is revealing his secrets about how to counter his army. Yeah, after he's done winning, uh, maybe, you know, before the battle scroll. <laughs> but, uh, hey man, he didn't yeah, need that... anymore. He's good. He made his point. Yeah. <laughs> Oh my god! He was, he was already the best scenes player in the world, man. Come on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He didn't. Yeah, he didn't need the new book, you know, honestly. But oh man. We also have the first of our list spotlight videos with the beginner competitive list. Uh, this is the one we received the most requests for. So we'll be going over how we formed the list, the units we picked, why we picked them, 
uh, what you could slot in there instead. We will talk about uh, strengths and weaknesses, matchups. Uh, then we'll even have like some battle report style things where we take some photos of our games, looking at deployment. We explain why we deployed the way we did um, and, and go from there. So if you want to see more of those list spotlight videos, then feel free to go back to our Lords of the Storm video, check which lists you want to see and let us know. And that's it for this episode. Thank you for listening and we'll see you in the next one.